Hello everyone, welcome to HIM 216. This is a continuation of the lecture covering Chapter 3 in your textbook. Um, I would like for you to go to page 53 in your textbook. And <clears throat> we reviewed this earlier in a lecture, but I want to go over it again. It's a part of your homework. Um, if we look at this chapter, chapter 12, remember if we click up here on the, um, in the tabular side, we can get to any of the chapters. And if we, we can actually click on any of these chapters. When we click on chapter 2, we'll notice that this chapter 2 is the chapter for neoplasms. The range of codes for this chapter is C00 through D49. We have notes at the very beginning of this chapter that apply to the entire chapter. Um, for this particular chapter, we have a number of sections, and this is the section list, and it actually goes beyond the bottom of the screen that you can see, and when you log into uh, 3M, you will see um, all of these. And then if we click on a specific section, and for instance, the first section is malignant neoplasm C00 through C96. If I click on this section list, and I'm going to have to go down, I will then see the categories that are in this section. So we've looked at the chapter, the section, and then this is the category. So the first category for this particular chapter is C00, malignant neoplasm of lip. And when I click on this category, I will then see additional information. Um, I have an instructional note, use additional code to identify. So for instance, if this patient had a history of alcohol abuse and dependence, or a history of tobacco use or dependence, um, then, or if they were currently using tobacco, I would need to also code, add those codes. I do have an excludes one note. This excludes one note applies to every code in this category of C00. My first subcategory is C00.0. And all of these four digit codes are subcategories. Um, let me and subcategories as we discussed earlier subcategories can be anywhere from four to seven characters in length and I don't seem to be finding one that's five six or seven characters in length so far um, but we'll find them so we'll see them as we code so make sure you're familiar with the structure of the tabular. Now, if you look on page 55 in exercise 3.1, this question asks you, the first question says, diseases of veins, lymphatic vessels, and lymph nodes, um, NEC. So if I um, actually um, go to the uh, drop-down box, these, remembering that these codes are all in um, alphanumeric order, I'll see that this range of codes, I-80 through I-89, is actually included in Chapter 9, Diseases of the Circulatory System. And then if I want to find these codes, diseases of veins, lymphatic vessels, and lymph nodes, I-80 through I-89, that is a section. And that's what the instructions for this did, was they said, identify each of these as a chapter, um, block, which is also section, category, or subcategory. So this is a section or a block. Then for number two, diseases of the circulatory system, again, I'm going to click on this box. 
And I can find diseases of the circulatory system, I00 through I99. That is a chapter. So that is a chapter 9. Um, and then we have a specific code here. And this is not 181. <clears throat> this is I81. So I'm going to put in I81. And it will take me to this code, portal vein thrombosis. This is a category. So this code I81 is a, is a category. And then it, <clears throat> the next question is, well, what about I82? <clears throat> Excuse me, I-82 is also a category. And then it says, what about I-82.0? I-82.0 is a four-digit code. It is a subcategory. Now, we talked about placeholder characters in an earlier chapter. And in exercise 3.2, it wants you to look at a particular code and select the appropriate seventh character. So let's go in and look at this. So I'm going to put in S52.221. And of course, we're doing this in the tabular because the tabular is where you find the alphanumeric codes. So when I go to S52.221, I find S52.221. This is a red code. And I know that I have to have a more specific code. This particular code is sixth characters, and I have to apply a seventh character. And you'll notice that under this subcategory, S52.221, Two one. Um, it lists the seventh characters for the appropriate encounters. Let me go to the beginning of this category. One of the things you should always do is go to the beginning of a category and read the instructional notes. Um, and you have notes here that apply to this particular category. Um, I'm not going to read through those. That's not the purpose of this part of the lecture. But certainly if you were coding, you would pay attention to these and to the excludes notes. And then here we find that these are the seventh characters for category S52. And we're in category S52. When we look at this code S52.221, our category is S52. Our more specific, our subcategory is S52.221. And you can see we're in category S52. And then the 221 is a subcategory. So I am particularly um, I want to determine what the seventh character would be for a subsequent encounter. And I can do one of two things. I can go up to the beginning of this category, and I can come down and find the uh, correct seventh character. Um, this is a subsequent encounter for a fracture with a closed fracture with non-union. And so I have to look at these very carefully because you'll notice A, B, and C are for initial encounters. And then I began looking at the subsequent encounters. And I do see a subsequent encounter for a closed fracture with delayed healing, but that's not what I have. I have non-union. So if I scroll down, I'll see subsequent encounter for closed fracture with a non with non-union. So the the appropriate seventh character that I want to add to this to my code is a K. And I can go down to find my code again, S52.221. Just put that right. Right, S52.221. And if I click on this red code, then you see I will see those um, characters that are included at the beginning of this category.
So it's a little, to me, it's a little bit easier to go to the beginning of the category uh, than it is to go through this small screen. But those are your two options. And of course, if we look at K here, it tells us that this is um, displaced transverse fracture of shaft of right ulna subsequent encounter for closed fracture with non-union. So that's the complete description of this code S52.221 and we'd add a K. To have a complete code we'd have to add a K to the end of that. Now um, the next one we're going to look at uh, 50 at um, number 3 and for this one, we're at the same code, S52.221, but this is an initial encounter for an open fracture type 3B. So if we um, scroll back up to the top and look at our seventh characters, it's type 3B, so I knew I know that I need a code for initial encounter. It's got to be A, B, or C. And this is 3B, so initial encounter for open fracture. And that's what we have, open fracture type 3B. So my seventh character here is going to be a C. So I will have the same code, S52.221C. Let me see if I can get down here. <clears throat> S52.221, and then there's C. And then we're going to look at number five. Displaced fracture, again, of the right ulna, subsequent encounter, open fracture type 3B with malunion. Okay, so we have a lot of things that we have to consider in this. First of all, it's a subsequent encounter for an open fracture type 3B. Subsequent encounter, subsequent encounter, open fracture type 3B, routine healing. No, that's not it. Um, subsequent encounter 3B with delayed healing. Nope, that's not it either. So now we have to come down, subsequent encounter, open fracture 3B with non-union. Um, and it's not non-union, it's malunion. So we come down to R, which is the next group that includes 3B, subsequent encounter, open fracture 3B with malunion. So R is the seventh character that we want to add to our code. So our code is going to be S52.221 R. S52.221 and then we would add the R. Now as a reminder the answer to the even numbered exercises is at the student support website and that information is in the front of your textbook. Um, I also want to mention something else. Um, I wholeheartedly approve of highlighting in your book. As a matter of fact, when I'm preparing to teach, I highlight those things I want to make sure that I cover. The other thing that I want to strongly suggest is that anytime you are writing in your book, you use a pencil. Not a pen, not a magic marker, but you use a pencil so that if you change your mind about the code, it's easy to erase and you don't have a a mess of scratch outs in ink in your book and certainly you don't want to use liquid paper to try and make any corrections. So please get get a pencil and use that um, in your textbook. It's so much um, easier to correct. Um, <clears throat> in your book look at the on page 57 look at that first example. 
Um, and we're looking, this patient has deep vein thrombosis. And in the index, if you put in thrombosis, you'll find that main term. And then you can put in deep, but you'll see that it has a mandatory instructional note, C, embolism, vein, lower extremity. When you see that, you have to do that. So you click on that. And when, then when you go to lower extremity, you will find the subterm for deep. And of course, there's chronic, and then there's specified NEC and chronic NEC. Um, and then there is more specificity if you have that specificity. Now, I also want to demonstrate something else for you if I can get the my computer here to cooperate. If I put in thrombosis and then I put in vein and then I put in deep, you'll notice that I have locations here, calf, lower leg, thigh, upper leg. So if I look at these codes, it does take them to the same categories, acute embolism and thrombosis. So you can sometimes use terms and enter them in the index um, slightly differently um, and still come up with the same coding. And I will also tell you that you have to spell correctly in the index. You have to spell it right. If you don't spell it right, it's not intuitive. It's not going to do spell check for you. You have to spell it. You have to spell correctly. And you'll notice if we do um, embolism, vein, and then deep, it takes us to this same code, I82.40. And you'll notice there's dash. Looks, look at all of these codes that have a dash. So as a reminder, that takes us to a category, and we have to actually choose the most specific code based on the anatomic site. And I want to show you something here, and this is um, one of the, ICD-10 is much more specific than ICD-9, and one of the ways that it has much more specificity is through laterality. So if I'm looking at this code, you'll notice that it is for veins of the right lower extremity. Then there's one for veins of left lower extremity. There's also a code for bilateral, and then there's unspecified, which means you don't know whether it was the right or the left leg. When we're coding in ICD-10, um, we code to the most specific code. If there were not a bilateral code available and my patient had DVT in both of her lower extremities, I would be applying a code for the right leg and a code for the left leg. So when you are coding um, and something is bilateral, but there's not a code that includes the term bilateral, you have to code each side. And an example of this is like a knee replacement. Sometime pa sometimes patients will have the right knee replaced, um, and then they'll come back and have the left knee, but sometimes patients have both knees replaced at the same time. And when they come in for the, um, usually it's some osteoarthritis, when they come in with osteoarthritis, arthritis of uh, those knees, um, uh, if there's not a bilateral code, you have to code each of those separately. And that same rationale carries over into the procedural coding system, which we will use the procedure tab to get into the procedural coding system. In the next example, the patient has adhesive bursitis of the shoulder. And here, if I type in bursitis, and you can see that there is a subterm for adhesive, it says C bursitis specified NEC. So I click on that. And when I click on that, um, 
actually what I can see is bursitis shoulder. So if I go back and do bursitis and then shoulder, um, it says adhesive. See capsulitis adhesive. And I can see capsul capsulitis adhesive shoulder M75.0. And then looks, let's go to bursitis again. Um, if we do adhesive, specified NEC, then we see shoulder, see bursitis shoulder, and then again adhesive, see capsulitis adhesive. So there are a couple different ways to get to the same code within that category. So I can do bursitis, and then right off the bat I see adhesive here. Bursitis specified NEC, I click on it. When I click, I see shoulder, and it says see bursitis shoulder, so I click on that. And when I do, I see adhesive, and it sends me to capsulitis adhesive. So I click on that, and then I find my code. If I had put in, and again, you have to spell right, bursitis shoulder, I would have cut out a step because I would not have gone uh, to um, specified NEC, but it would send me to the same, the same place. So, so, you know, there are sometimes different ways that you can get to codes. So I want you to um, turn to page 58. And in this, in exercise three, the main terms in the index, and in this, <clears throat> I'm going to, um, the even questions are in your um, student resources. But let's look at the first one, decubitus ulcer of the heel. So let me look up decubitus. If I do, it says see ulcer pressure by sight. So I can click and I can go over to pressure ulcer and I can find um, uh, the different stages of pressure ulcers. And you would know, typically know the um, uh, stage of that pressure ulcer. But I can also do ulcer. ulcer, pressure, and get there that way as well. Now I want you to flip back to page 57 for just a minute because under indexes to diseases and injuries it talks about the main terms. The last sentence of that paragraph tells you main terms usually are identified by disease conditions and nouns. The main term is not a body part or site. Um, it's also not acute. It's also not chronic. So sometimes you'll, so as a part of this learning process, you'll have to play around with main terms and subterms um, to find the, find your codes. And it just takes practice. If we look at number three, respiratory anthrax. So if I put in respiratory, do you see it says, see also condition. So respiratory is a body system. It's not a disease. So if I put in anthrax and then respiratory, and I can put a comma here, and it will take me right down to respiratory. Do you see it's highlighted in blue? 
then I can click on that code. I want to verify the code in the tabular. And this that is very important, and I mentioned that in an earlier lecture. You must verify your codes in the tabular. So once you find it in the index, you go to the tabular. Once you go to the tabular, you check to see if there are any instructional notes that apply to this particular category or subcategory. In this instance, we can see it. We don't have to scroll up, but most of the time, you have to scroll up to the beginning of the category and read the instructional notes. If you don't do that, you are going to make coding errors. Um, okay, and then number five is gouty arthritis. If I put in gouty, uh, you can now do you see on right here where it has gout and gouty? So I need to just put my cursor there and back up. And <clears throat> these are my non-essential modifiers. And you also see, it says, see also gout chronic. Um, I actually don't have chronic documented here. And I'm going to put in arthritis, but it doesn't, it's not here. These are in alphabetical order. It's induced. Um, you can see that it has in here, but, but it's not listed there. So what I need to do is put in arthritis and then gout, gouty, and it's acute. It's not chronic, it's acute, and it says see gout idiopathic. Well, that's a mandatory note, and of course we have to do that because we don't have any other choice, and it pops up idiopathic. This code M10.00 is the default code. If we knew what site was affected, we could pick a code for that specific site, but we don't. It's an unspecified site, so I'm going to come over here and and um, scroll up to the beginning of this category, and you can see that these are um, inclusion terms, acute gout, gout attack, gout flare, and then we have this instructional note, use additional code to identify, and then these are all of the other conditions that this patient could have that you would also code, and this gives you Sometimes it's the full code, sometimes it, you see there's a dash there, a dash there. You would always click on that code to make sure that you had the most specific code. Now, interestingly, I chose the cardiomyopathy. When I go there, this is cardiomyopathy in diseases classified elsewhere. And you have an instructional note, code first underlying disease. And there's our code for gout right there. So in this particular instance, we would have to list the code for the gout first. Then we would have the code for the cardiomyopathy. Anytime you see this term in diseases classified elsewhere, that you're going to see this instructional note, code first underlying disease. And these that means that this particular code cannot ever be a principal diagnosis code or a first listed diagnosis code. It is always going to be a secondary diagnosis code. Um, <clears throat> we're going to do three, four, and um, the instructions, and always read the instructions, the instructions say use the index only to assign codes to the following conditions. Okay, so in this instance we have asthma due to detergent. So my disease process here is asthma. So I've got asthma, and then I'm going to put in due to, because it's asthma due to detergent. J69.8. So just using the index, that would be my code. But however, I'm a good teacher and I'm going to tell you, verify it in the tabular. Just for the heck of it, go over and look at it in the tabular. You can see that this category is pneumonitis due to solids and liquids. We do have an excludes note one here, neonatal aspiration post-procedural pneumonitis. When we come down to our code, J69.8, we can see that this is also, it says pneumonitis due to aspiration of blood, detergent. 
and then code first to identify the substance. So if we knew, um, we could go to the, we're not going to do that. I do not want to confuse you. But at any rate, we would go to the drug table and look up detergent, and that would be our first listed code. But these instructions are only asking you to code the um, asthma due to detergent, and that's what we've done. Um, for number two, Parkinsonism associated with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. So in the index, we are going to go to Parkinsonism. And you see, I only had to put into the PARK. And so this is Parkinsonism associated with. And you'll notice with is the first subterm, neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, G90.3. So that would be our code, G90.3. And if we look at it <clears throat> in the... Um, tabular, we can see that the category is G90, disorders of um, autonomic nervous system. There is an excludes note one that applies to all of the codes in category G90. And then when we go back to our code, down to our code, we do have an excludes note one. If the patient just has orthostatic hypotension and it is not associated with Parkinsonism, then we are at a different code. We're at I-95.1. But this is, this is our code. And then finally, list the subterms for um, Coriza. So what we're going to do, if we go to C-O-R-Y-Z-A, our subterms are with grip or influenza, C, influenza with respiratory manifestation, and then syphilitic, syphilitic with a more specific subterm of congenital. So those are the subterm for Coriza. Now that's going to end this lecture. In the next lecture, we will finish out this chapter and maybe look at the coding conventions in a little more detail.